Hi everyone. Yep, uh, I'm a PhD student at the University of Southampton, and I'll be discussing some of the geological results of the uh, the Blue Mining Project, which is a, a European-funded project that I was a part of. Uh, so I'm going to be discussing the, the surface mapping and basically the drilling of these extinct massive sulphide deposits that we've uh, sort of trying to investigate. And then I'll sort of show a bit of the, the actual the drilling, the, the samples that my PhD is looking into, and some of the implications of the processes that are actually ongoing at the end of these deposits. And my colleague, uh, Romina, will follow this talk with a, a discussion about the geophysical methods that we use sort of that complement the geological techniques. So to be, start with a quite basic sort of description, um, why are we interested in sea from massive sulphides? Well, they're considered to be the modern analog of VMS deposits, which are a historically proven resource. Uh, they have typically quite high concentrations of, uh, or, or actual metal concentrations, so we have up to sort of 13 percent weight, weight copper. So although they're smaller, they're quite high grade. And we also have sort of uh, notable amounts of uh, these critical metals which are coming to the fore in our research at the moment with the green technologies, wanted to be research with the uh, sort of gallium, cadmium, indium, etc. Um, we also have the, the nice fact that uh, there's over 70% of ocean spreading axes that are still unexplored. So we've got a lot of potential for just the general basic exploration. And so why are we looking at the ocean spreading centers? Well, this is a nice distribution map of, of, sort of known systems that we have at the moment. And you can see they're focusing on the ocean spreading centers. So the heat that drives these hydrothermal cycles are coming from these ocean spreading centers. The other issue, not the fact that some are in the middle of the ocean itself, is the, the depth. So of a, the database of over 700 active, confirmed, and inferred, and inactive systems, they are basically 70% of those systems are below 1,500 meters water depth. So the technological challenges just getting down that deep to start with is somewhat of an issue. And it's one of these systems that were the focus for our EU project. So the TAG hydrothermal field is located in the Atlantic Ocean and it's at approximately three and a half thousand meters depth. And the main reason why we're interested in it is the fact that it's, it's a known hydrothermal field. It has an active hydrothermal mound, which was drilled in the early uh, 1990s. So we have an idea of what this mound looks like in three dimensions, but we also have confirmed inactive mounds within the same area. And to develop a technique to try and explore and find these inactive mounds, we wanted to have a, a good starting point that we knew quite well. So the first point of Thing that we actually did is we tried to basically improve all the, the data that we had already. So on the left hand side we have a bathymetry map of the, the tag hydrothermal area. It was taken in the, the late 90s and although these two images are slightly different scales you can see that the, the map on the right which is uh, AUV based bathymetry data that was uh, obtained uh, a couple of years ago on one of our research cruises is a much higher detail. You can see a lot more features straight off and if you're trying to find these inactive mounds, it's a, a nice sort of basic data set like this is, is fantastic to see. Um, this is at two meter resolution, this map on the right hand side, and we were able to go even higher, and this is one of these inactive mounds, uh, and that's at 50 centimeter resolution. So very, very sort of, uh, high resolution, and, and it's quite easy to see a lot of these features. So you can clearly see a, a series of faults that cross cut this mound itself. And the main way that we'd like to determine whether it is definitely a hydrothermal mound or whether it's just a, a, an active basaltic mound is to basically try and get boots on the ground, but obviously that's difficult at the bottom of the ocean. So we have basically remote surveying. So these are a series of, uh, sort of screenshots from HD footage of one of our uh, underwater vehicles that we sent down to investigate it. And you can see on the top right hand corner here, we have the, the summit of the mound. There's no active smoker, there's no plume and there's a bit of pelagic sediment covering it. Uh, we also have some evidence of there being sort of uh, oxidized, iron-rich oxidized sediments, which is an indication of hydrothermal activity. And within those fault scarps that I mentioned earlier, we've got large boulders. So these large boulders are, are they're sulfide dominated. We've managed to grab some, cut them open, they're sulfides. And the, the green coloration you can see on the bottom right image is a secondary copper mineral. So looking at these fault scarps, it appears that you've got massive sulfide material quite shallow to the surface, so I mean, maybe 50, 60 centimetres down, which is a great indication. But if you want to do sort of 3D resourcing, you need to do the drilling. And this is what you get from just the, the, sort of the two-dimensional aspect of things. You get a surface map. So as I said, you can look at the bathymetry, you can look at what we see on the ground, and you can effectively map out the extent of the mounds themselves but you can't have that third dimension without drilling. 
So this is where the BGS's RD2 rig came into play. And it has the capability of drilling up to 55 metres below the seafloor. So we've deployed that on three of these uh, extinct mountains within the area that we're looking at. And this is a composite sort of a drill core on the right-hand side of the screen. No, sorry, left-hand side of the screen. No way. And what you can immediately see is there's a difference from what we saw in the fault scarps and what we saw in the drilling. So we expected sulphides to be quite shallow, sort of 50, maybe 60 centimetres under sediment cover. But we didn't hit sulphides until at least three metres, sometimes even deeper, seven metres. So we have this, this other unit that wasn't seen in the actual sort of the, the surface geology. And that's it basically it, it's, it was just different. And that's, this is where my, my PhD comes into play. This is, this is where I'm investigating it. So these are some uh, hand specimen examples from the drill core of, of this material. And even though it, visually it looks quite iron oxide dominated, all the, the reds and the oranges, there's actually only about sort of between 5 and 30% weight iron in these materials. It's mainly silica. And this is quite an interesting phenomenon, really. We, we're basically interpreting, uh, interpreting this as being a, a late stage process. And it basically has the, the mound itself, the hydrothermal system is cooling. This, this final stage product is forming. But... It's quite, it's quite a less known sort of uh, actual process. I mean, a lot of these deposits are in the process of being active, coming in active. And we want to know what's happening, what processes are actually forming this sort of layer itself. So have a, a quick look at the, some of the, the actual thin section material itself. And you can see these, the iron oxide formation is, is quite varied. You've got these individual class of iron oxide and silica, which I refer to as a sort of a jasperoidal fragment. So that in itself is iron oxide material that has then been solidified with basically uh, immature silica. And the image in the bottom left-hand corner is a, a laminated fragment which has undergone some kind of desiccation. So when immature silica starts to mature, it basically becomes less hydrated and it starts to break up and fracture. But we also have potential uh, evidence of sort of fluid-driven precipitation with these dendritic growth type textures and potentially microbial mediated uh, sort of iron oxide precipitation in these, these iron oxide filaments that we have here. So initially we, we're seeing quite a, a large textural variation in this sort of material and the indication that there's a lot of small scale processes that are going on to try and form this actual unit itself. When we have a look again at the, so the silica, so the image on the top left-hand side here is, again, these brecciated fragments potentially associated with desiccation. But you can see clearly here that there is at least two different generations of uh, solidification. The first generation is actually forming this, the, these jasperoidal fragments itself. Then that becomes more mature, it desiccates, fractures, and then you have further silica precipitation on the outside. And there's the same evidence here on the, the, the top right-hand image where you've got some nice radial silica. So even then, you've potentially got cycles of iron oxide precipitation, silica, iron oxide, silica, and it just is, is quite, seemingly quite variable from where you are in the mound itself. The, the final image there is, is sort of basically it's all pigmented silica. So you have recrystallized quartz, so it's very mature, and a lot of the actual coloration there are very fine grain iron oxide particles that have just remained during this recrystallization process. So one of the key observations is where you have this, this silica precipitation, you have a significant decrease in the pore space within the samples themselves. So that the whole unit itself is becoming a lot less porous, which can have a lot of implications when you think about any further fluid flow or any try and ingress of oxidized uh, seawater trying to get into the mound and actually attack the, the ore minerals that are lower depth than this material itself. And we have another uh, interesting feature, which is I'm going to discuss next, which is sulphides. So we have this curious juxtaposition of iron oxides and iron sulphides within the same samples. And we can start to get an idea of how this fits into the whole system by looking at, again, the textures of these sulphides themselves. So in the top left-hand image here, we have a, a pyrite and sphalerite so a couple of grains. And you can see there's almost there's like a peppered, there's a, a, a texture in these, these sulfides. And they are actually early silica, uh, silica globules that have already precipitated. And this sulfide is then overgrowing this material. So it's a nice indication you basically got these sulfides that are forming late in the system. They're forming after we've already had some degree of silicification. We also have evidence of bleaching material. So the image on the right-hand side is, is 
within one of these iron rich samples and you've got uh, iron rich filamentous material on the right hand side but you've got almost pure silica on the left so there's been some kind of fluid that's run through it it's basically ended up reducing and remobilizing the iron in the system but only on a local scale and the, the final image is, is an SEM image and you can quite clearly see that the boundary between these two different types of environments you have uh, reduced iron which is the pinky blobs and then you have the the actual oxidized iron itself uh, in a different area. So there's, there's some kind of complex fluid regime that's circulating through these systems at the, at the end of their actual formation processes that's having a, an impact on the actual deposit as a whole. So to discuss these as, as processes themselves, um, the idea is that in all cases we've seen that the iron oxide is forming first, whether it be microbially me mediated, whether it's sulfide material, plume fallout material or a direct hydrothermal precipitate. That is basically the, the, the precursor to this uh, iron silicate unit itself. There has to be iron oxide there. And then you can have um, a, it's a, a result of the, a low temperature hydrothermal fluid, but it's some degree of mixing with seawater. So you, at the end of the cycle, the high temperature fluid which forms most of the sulfide materials has started to cease, maybe the, the, the heat source is dropping off. So you've got a cooling of the fluid itself. Then we have the, the second process, which is discussing more of the silica precipitation. Uh, so silica is typically temperature uh, controlled, so there has to be some kind of cooling involved. And then you have this silica depositing, and it's nucleating on the iron oxides, regardless of how they're formed. And we have this, this example where you're having this decrease in pore space, this, uh, this decrease in porosity, and it could potentially be creating a barrier over the underlying massive sulfide units and preventing the oxygenated seawater from getting into the deposit itself and oxidizing the ore minerals themselves. And you're likely having a, a, a change in cyclicity. You've got iron oxide precipitation, silica precipitation, iron oxide precipitation, and this is probably quite varied across the whole mound itself. And then the final piece of evidence we have here is this this, this, late, this real late stage process of potentially a, a resurgence of, of high temperature fluid. Um, we're basically getting a scenario where, where there's iron oxide material that's either less coated in silica or less protected, that's then available to be oxidized, that's available to be remobilized and re-precipitated as, uh, as actually iron sulfides. And that is, is quite a, a curious feature where we have that juxtaposition of oxidized material and reduced material in the same environment. So ultimately, these, these processes are, are theoretically ongoing at the end of this deposit type. And the main sort of takeaway messages from this sort of presentation as a whole is that obviously these deposits are classified as being in an extreme environment. I mean, they're typically quite deep. And it's only with the recent development of technology in the last 20, 30 years that we've actually got the capability to get down there and actually serve that sample them like we would try and do in a, in a normal on-land deposit. And we need this, this combination of geological and geophysical techniques to come up with a, a three-dimensional model. And for a resource estimation thing, we, we need that third dimension, which is, is critical and quite often the most problematic thing from a geological perspective when you're looking at these C4 deposits. And finally, we've got evidence provided from the samples that we've obtained that give us a, a nice insight into some of these complex uh, sort of formations and these complex processes that are forming at the end of this deposit itself. And we've got potentially uh, evidence for uh, an auto-preservation mechanism, effectively creating this, this impermeable barrier over dying these, these sulfide deposits on the seafloor, which is quite nice if you want to try and mine them in the future, because you've still got the nice ore material preserved. And that's all for me. Thank you.